Well, hello. So the other day I was informed on stream that I have a wiki feet page. It's probably not even my feet. Oh my God. <laughs> there are so many pictures. There's comments. Am I blushing? I feel my face getting hot. It was all fun and games until I realized that my feet get more views than most of my YouTube videos. Maybe it's finally time to go full foot tuber. Fortunately, foot fetishes aren't the least bit threatening, but it does make you wonder doesn't it? <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Why do some people get off to feet or toes or random objects like balloons? Fetishes for all their quirks are a normal part of human sexuality, but they're kind of mysterious. Today, I wanna to take a little peek into the shadowy corners of the human mind to better understand fetishes. What does any good critical thinker do first? define their terms. You may have noticed that the word kinks and fetishes are used interchangeably in the media, on Reddit, sex blogs, but today we're talking science and in sexology, they are actually two distinct concepts. Kinks are the broad umbrella of non-traditional sexual behaviors or fantasies that you might find hot or incorporate in the bedroom. Almost everybody has a kink. Some studies put it at over 90% with these being the most popular. They're so common that you could reasonably argue that we should not even call them kinks. They're just very common, widely held desires. But this video is not about kinks, it is about fetishes. Fetishes are a kind of kink, but they're more intense. They're usually a deeply held part of someone's sexuality, enduring over time, and crucially, most people with the fetish can't get off without it. Fetishes usually fall under one of three categories. They can be objects, they can be behaviors, or non-sexual body parts. And literally any object could become a fetish in the right circumstances. Hairbrushes, artificial limbs, safety pins, snails, whips, roses, glasses, the handlebars of bikes. These are just a few fetishes that have been documented in the literature. The most common fetish though is a body part, feet, and objects associated with feet, like heels or stockings. Foot fetishes really do take the cake. They account for almost half of all fetishes. Fetishes. Which if you're a very online person, probably is no surprise. We're gonna get into why foot fetishes are so common a little later in the video, but first, one more category of note, there is an even smaller subcategory of fetishes called paraphilias. These are classed as psychological disorders and usually crimes. This is because paraphilias by definition involve non-consenting victims. Think of things like exhibitionism, voyeurism, and other dark sexuality behaviors. I only mention this because paraphilias should not be confused for fetishes as a whole. The vast majority of fetishes out there and fetishists are not predatory or harmful. They're just quirks of human sexuality. All right, context, check. So how exactly does someone end up getting off to a balloon or a shoe? Well, there's still plenty of mystery on this topic. There's one thing that we know almost certainly. Most fetishes are formed in childhood before we're fully aware of our own sexuality. And this might explain why so many fetishes seem to have a sort of childlike primary school quality about them. Like who's been a bad boy or a good girl and who's gonna get punished later. From infancy to puberty, but especially starting around age eight, our sexuality is rapidly developing, which is why childhood experiences can have such a tremendous impact on us and our sexuality for the rest of our lives. Fetishes can start with some of the first vaguely sexual feelings that we might have, or feelings that aren't even sexual, but just kind of feel similarly. The autonomic nervous system that regulates sexual arousal and function also regulates other types of arousal, like fear, think shame, anticipation, anxiety, all feelings that are pretty common in childhood. And along these lines, there is some evidence that kids who are sexually shamed when they're growing up are more likely to wind up with a fetish. Many fetishists can identify the precise moment in their childhood when their fetish began. Like the kid who regularly rubbed up on their stuffed animals or watched Lion King 800 times who became a furry. Or the child who was spanked when they were caught touching themselves we may enjoy being spanked as adults. Or the boy who was dressed up in his mom's bras and high heels by an older sibling who now takes a liking to cross-dressing. There are many cases like these. Another example you guys might find interesting is the work of Dr. Robert Stoller. He did a series of comprehensive interviews with people in LA who were into a very hardcore BDSM scene. And he ended up finding an unexpected thread that linked all of these people together. They all had serious illnesses as kids and had undergone regular painful medical treatment. Basically, they coped by eroticizing the pain. But what about feet and toes? Many researchers, starting with our boy Freud, 
noted that children and babies are much more aware of feet because they're closer to the ground. They're also more likely to go barefoot, to touch their own feet, to tickle feet. And when it comes to their development, feet can be a site of tremendous frustration and struggle for kids as they learn to walk, and to tie their shoes. Freud believed that our sexual development unfolds in five different stages. As we grow up, different parts of our body become important sites of pleasure, of frustration, or perhaps both. And he argued that improper resolution of each of these developmental stages could cause us to confuse these feelings or become fixated on this site when we got older. But where Freud really seems to go off the rails is with his foot fetish theory. Freud thought that foot fetishes begin the first time a boy looks up at his mother and realizes that she doesn't have a penis. Suddenly, the boy is filled with fear that he could lose his penis too. Freud may have been projecting here. He's very into penises. The theory goes that the fetish object is the last thing the boy saw before having this pivotal, mind-blowing realization. Of course, in his universe of castration anxiety, women either don't exist or don't have fetishes, which it's true that it's less common in women, but in his theories, women often feel like this sort of afterthought. Now, if you, like me, are not really buying the whole castration anxiety explanation, fear not. Today, researchers have a much better supportive theory. The most popular explanation that you'll find on the internet for a foot fetish is the crossed wires theory. Basically, an area of the brain related to genital sensation is very close to an area of the brain related to foot sensation. The theory goes that if the wires get crossed or misfired, you can end up with a foot fetish. I think I might have even talked about this theory a long time ago in a video. All the more reason to update, because from what I can tell, it's mostly speculation based on a single paper that was about phantom limb syndrome that people sort of extrapolated and applied to foot fetishes. More research needed. Classical conditioning is the most widely accepted theory of how fetishes form. You might remember Pavlov's dogs from Intro to Psychology. Pavlov discovers that his dogs begin to salivate when they hear a bell because they associate a bell with food. With fetishes, the object, your body part, or whatever it may be, is present at the same time of some level of sexual arousal or even just those autonomic aroused feelings. And when the object and the sensation occur together over and over and over, over again, they can become paired. And the more this association is repeated, especially when you throw in the powerful reinforcement of orgasm into the mix, the stronger that pairing can become. One of the more interesting studies happened in the 60s when scientists managed to give a group of men a fetish for knee-high boots in a lab. They did this by presenting a slide of the boots alone and then followed it with slides of sexy pictures. And then they repeated this over and over again over multiple sessions. It took anywhere from 24 to 60 repeats for the subject in the experiment to get an erection just from the boots alone. Now this kind of research couldn't happen today because of the IRB, I mean, you can't just go around giving people random fetishes, but the basic principles of classical conditioning are used in lots of different situations. It's actually used to treat alcoholism and smoking. There are medications that will dull the positive feelings or even make someone feel sick if they drink or smoke. But of course, conditioning someone to feel any particular way about their sexuality actually has a pretty brutal history. A lot of ethical concerns there. All right, my dears, I know that was a lot. I wanted to try to do something that had a little bit more detail than I usually give. Let me know what you think about that. Don't forget to check out the podcast. Lots of spicy conversations happening there. And I'm also streaming every Thursday here at 7 p.m. Eastern. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.